Everyone knows the story of Titanic, but one of the most prevailing questions that continues to this day is how did the ship break in two? Two inquiries held after the disaster concluded that the ship had not broken in two, leading to much public confusion until the discovery of the wreck in the 1980s, and it cemented the fact that it had. Ever since that discovery, scores of people have devoted thousands of hours to figure out just how Titanic came to rest in two pieces on the ocean floor. One of these is the engineer Roy Manoir. This video is based upon his breakup theory. Roy begins by asking, which failed first, the keel or the upper decks? According to Roy, the breakup has to adhere to four rules. Rule number one, the breakup process has to sink the stern. A clean break leaves the stern floating as its own ship or restarts an entirely new sinking scenario. Two, the keel cannot behave like shoe leather. The keel and cellular double bottom were designed to be rigid and therefore were extremely brittle under the extreme compression stresses of the brake. Bending that keel removes all strength from it like bending a piece of cardboard. After bending and eliminating its strength, the keel could never pull down the stern. If the ship did break down from the top to the double bottom, it now has to do what the entire intact ship structure couldn't do, support and pull the weight of the stern. Rule number three, once you've accounted for all the pieces of the wreck, you have to account for the forces that made them into pieces. Steel doesn't just come apart. There has to be a force or major stress that breaks it. This is where top-down scenarios are weakest. Once the stress of the tipped up predicament breaks the ship from top to bottom, all that stress and energy required to break off other portions of the ship are gone. Steel structures do not simply flake off or pop off in water currents. A 25 knot current cannot break steel, especially if the steel keeps adjusting itself to the path of least resistance. Parts can't be thrown off by centrifugal force from a rotating stern because it will never be able to spin at the required revolutions to break that steel. Gravity is neutralized if both the main part and the loose parts are already falling in tandem. And finally, rule number four. The breakup process has to leave the wreck in the way that we find it today on the sea floor. Using a stick as an example, there are tension stresses at the top of the ship trying to pull it apart and compression stresses at the bottom trying to crush everything together. Canceling these two forces out is a neutral axis which resides in the middle of the ship. In a compression stress break or bottom up scenario, the steel doesn't have to break, it just has to bend. At that moment in which the stick bends at the bottom, the bottom can no longer balance out against the tension stresses up top and it fails instantly. The catalyst driving Roy's research into the breakup was the condition of the wreck while building his wreck model. He found that shell plating on the starboard side of the stern is missing for 160 feet aft of the tear line and 120 feet on the port side. But in contrast to this, the bow's shell plating is almost entirely intact except in the tear area and bulges from impact with the sea floor. The smoking gun, as Roy mentions, are the two sections of double bottom found for the 2005 History Channel program Titanic's Achilles Heel. The 19.5 inch by 3 inch steel bar can only be bent into the S shape found on those double bottom sections by severe compression and not tension stress. So now that you understand the forces and the method of the breakup, Let's switch into a further view for an explanation into just how Titanic broke apart, according to Roy Manoir. The boat deck and A deck are superstructures, and as such, they are not fully connected to the hull. They were made of quarter inch thick steel deck and wall plating. Because of their independent construction from the hull, 
they contribute very little to the breakup and act more as a reactionary force to what is pulverizing the ship from below. Both decks also have a natural division point in the form of expansion joints. The decks physically stop at these sections and are covered by a brass plate. This small division in the forward and aft section of the boat deck and A deck helped Titanic to handle stresses better when under high sea conditions. When Titanic bent to such a degree that the breakup began and the stern begins to settle back, the boat deck and A deck were now stretched longer than they were designed to be stretched. This action created new expansion joints in the deck plating of Titanic's two topmost decks. These new fracture points now split Titanic even further into what is known as the bow section, the forward tower section, the aft tower section, and the stern section. The forward tower is comprised of several decks clustered around the uptake for the number three funnel. A feature of this piece of debris is what Roy Minois describes as a honeycomb of vertical steel walls that reinforce it and give it stability. The rear of the forward tower is where the normal aft expansion joint sits. Aft of this expansion joint is the aft tower debris. Here a new form of braking takes place. The aft tower on the boat deck only includes the port side of the deck and the deck house for the engine room uptake and second class grand staircase. The starboard side of the aft tower from the boat deck down to D deck all broke differently so it's most likely that it was either pulverized during the breakup and it's lying in the debris field or possibly still attached to the aft tower. Without further scrutiny of the debris field, we can't be certain. Moving aft, we now come to the stern section. The first major feature of this is the deckhouse roof of the first class smoking room, which also housed the base of the number four funnel. The port side of this part of the boat deck broke at the aft end but the starboard side broke at the forward end. The whereabouts of the port side piece of decking is currently unknown, and the starboard side flipped upwards and draped itself over the side of the stern rack, as observed through expedition footage. The roof of the first class smoking room and deck house for the number four funnel were ripped from the stern during the breakup. An interesting note that Roy mentions on B deck down were the introduction of corner doublers in the funnel uptakes. These were trapezoidal pieces of steel meant to prevent cracks from spreading if they ever started while Titanic was at sea. But during the breakup, when cracks were forming in the steel, it's very likely that these small trapezoidal pieces caused the cracks to radiate outwards from the number three funnel casing and helped to form the forward and aft tower sections instead of them ripping themselves to shreds and then heading down to the sea floor. Now, having seen what happened to Titanic, we can view the breakup in slow motion and begin to understand the dynamics of the break. At roughly 2.17 a.m., Titanic has reached at least a 15 degree angle, but no higher than a 23 degree angle, when the keel cannot withstand the compression forces any longer. It fails and the double bottom bends upwards. As this bend occurs, it shortens the length of the ship's bottom and causes the shell plating on both port and starboard to begin to bulge outwards from the ship's inner structure. Inside the ship, the foremost cylinders of the reciprocating engines, boilers for room one, and coal bunkers and watertight bulkhead are all shoved upwards into the decks above. Due to the reinforced galley section walls of F and E deck, these sections remain intact to some degree, but they begin to radiate cracks outward from the number three funnel casing on each deck. As these cracks travel up each deck, the neutral axis begins to rise from the center of the ship towards the top decks of the superstructure, fracturing them even further. Titanic stern now begins to settle back downward and the additional compression and tension forces begin to form top-down breaks and fractures between the forward and aft tower sections. The shell plating begins to buckle and fail, ripping away from the ship's structure on the stern by 120 feet on port and 160 feet on the starboard side. This failure of the shell plating opens up Titanic's engine and turbine rooms to the ocean, 
allowing them to be inundated with water. The only thing holding Titanic together now is B-Deck, with its reinforced double-inch thick plating. The bow begins to submerge, twisting to port as it sinks beneath the surface. This lowering motion of the bow begins to pull on the stern and cause it to rise upwards again. The bottom of the ship now opens up, and the pulverized contents begin to make their way to the bottom of the Atlantic. Titanic's superstructure begins to smash itself into each other, and the aft tower and forward tower are violently ejected from the ship at or near the surface, holding themselves together again due to the strong reinforced vertical honeycomb wall pattern. Titanic's B-deck, which is the only thing holding the ship together, finally fails, and the bow is now completely separated from the stern. Dr. Paul Lee estimates that the bow achieved a downward angle of no more than 35 degrees, as indicated by Edward Wilding at the British Inquiry. An angle greater than this would dislodge the boilers from their seats, but as they still remain firmly in their seats in the wreck, it lends some credence to this angle. Titanic's stern is now tipped up and nearly vertical in the water, gracefully turning to port. Some survivors claim that it remained above water for a full five minutes before submerging. As the poop deck begins to submerge, the forward ends of the stern and the well deck begin to implode due to atmospheric pressure changes and a further pulverization of the stern takes place. Finally at 2.20 a.m., Titanic has slipped beneath the waves. The breakup is estimated to have occurred over a period of time of 15 to 20 seconds by Roy Manoir. There were an estimated 1,500 people still on the ship and near it in the water when this violent event took place. <laughs>